This is another video from Straight Up. Uh, so check out his uh, YouTube channel. I just found him today, so I thought it was interesting of some of the histories he uh, was showing me. Alright. Uh, once again, full disclosure. The language is used in here may be disturbing to uh, some. Alright. Just remember and keep in mind that this was at the day and time uh, before the present. You know, uh, words were used totally different back in the day uh, for whatever reason. And uh, this is me, so excuse me, y'all. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, uh... I thought it was interesting because, uh, like I said on the other video, I never particularly seen us being different races because we're all men and women. Okay? I've seen races as aliens being a different race, God being a different race, angels being a different race, so on. Alright? Uh, so, it, I go into shades of color you know um, I'm a tan guy I'm not a white guy but everybody else in, in the world will call me white huh imagine that even though I'm not white you know um, most uh, what you guys say black people out there are not black they're dark shade of tan alright some may be extremely dark shade of tan but that's just the way I see it. Because I don't look straight forward. I always look around me. Alright. Let's uh, get some learning done. Hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. If you have viewed some of my previous videos, welcome back. This video should really raise an eyebrow. It did for me when I was conducting the research. Okay, so this video, as you can see, is titled, Prominent Americans You Assumed Were White. How many times when recording or listening to someone speak about history do we assume that that person that they are speaking about is white, just based on their title or position? Oftentimes we, including myself in the past tense, usually assume that the individual is white. This is not a coincidence. In my opinion, this is due to the fact that we as Americans have been conditioned to believe only white people, for the most part, have accomplished anything of importance. How often do we pay attention to historical figures' appearance? I know that while doing research for my videos, there were many books, articles, and newspapers that totally skipped over what the person looked like. In my opinion, this means you don't get a complete description of the person. Another factor, and this is a glaring issue, does the paint... That being said, y'all, that's the reason why the warrant specifically says description of the person uh, well we got pictures now it don't really matter uh, who's ever making these complaints needs to give a detailed description painting photo or etching even resemble the written description now I've also come across many books articles and newspapers that do have a physical description of the person but for some reason these pieces of literature don't make it onto the high school or college course reading list. Although, on the occasions when they do appear on the reading list, and the subject has a shallow or light, tawny, brown, olive, dark, swarthy complexion, the darker complexion gets explained away as the person only having dark hair or eye color or both, which of course totally negates the meaning and definition of complexion. This false definition of complexion has been acceptable by academia for a very long time. However, now that the internet is available to the masses, it allows one to search thousands of keywords in seconds. You should soon come to realize, or at least some people realize, that there is something majorly wrong with how history has been portrayed. Again, as I always do in my videos, I will give you the definition of the word complexion. There are three basic categories when most people are described in history. 
complexion, hair color, and eye color. Although in modern times, we can change our complexion. Take Michael Jackson, for example. He kept the same hair color. However, he has had various complexions. He went from a dark complexion to a pale complexion. He is a perfect example of the extreme differences in complexions. He went from black to white. This is my theory. After conducting years of research, black Europeans of the colonial era and after did not consider themselves Negroes or what you and I would consider the typical black person today. There were several reasons for this and I don't want to delve into it too heavily. I can do that in another video. But briefly, black Europeans obviously were of a different culture. They spoke European languages. They had distinct accents. The elites considered themselves educated and intellectual. Some also had slight variations in eye color and hair texture. And this was due to hundreds of years of isolation and in many cases, mixtures of people. Although, after looking at evidence of... Okay, I want to pause it just for a second here. Uh, and I said that on a video or two ago a while back. But I believe in uh, early, teen, early 1600s, that there was a, what you guys call a black uh, man took to the Supreme Courts because he was a slave owner and he had a bunch of slaves and he was trying to make it illegal to own slaves and he, well, he got to keep his slaves, all right? Um, and I'm, I'm leaning towards the belief that because he was black and European goes into the the status situation okay and uh, the other black people came from a different country which was a different status so but that's just uh, me uh, believing at the time of what was going on okay so uh i'm gonna proceed forward sorry black european sculptures books journals etchings jewelry and religious paintings etc it's clear that many black europeans resemble the typical african-american we see walking around today with all their variations and complexions eye color and hair texture as far as the term Negro and who the Europeans called Negro, they were referring to the Aboriginal people of America, the AKA Indians. Okay, I can hear people now. Oh, sure. Now the American Indians were black people too. This is exactly what I'm saying. There's a huge amount of evidence for this assertion, but I am not going to cover that now. There are researchers who have hours and hours of research backing up this theory. I will do a video on that topic and link all the researchers to that video. Due to the obvious white supremacist tilt on what is provided to the public via our educational system, especially since the Woodrow Wilson administration, pointing out complexion is one of the only ways that the reader can determine the ethnicity of the subject, or in modern terms, is the person black or white. I mentioned Woodrow Wilson because it was during his administration that much of the common historical knowledge was omitted, destroyed, and rewritten to be replaced by Woodrow Wilson's historical point of view, which was based on the Lost Cause narrative. The Lost Cause narratives typically portray the Confederacy as a no- And I uh, just want to say that he confiscated a lot of state lands that he had no authority to do so. Uh, like the national parks and all that. United States uh, Union don't own them lands. They belong to the state. I don't know why this is hard for some people to comprehend, especially our states. Quit giving the federal government your land. Global, just, and aerobic group. So with Wilson's presidential power and academic influence, and also having been the former president of Princeton University, the majority of the nation stopped using the common history books of that era and started using the historical books literally written by Woodrow Wilson. A 
ten volume set of history books that in my estimation changed the nation. And just as a side note, the Board of Trustees of Princeton University on June 22nd, 2020 released a statement that read, Board of Trustees concludes that Wilson's racist views and policies make him an inappropriate namesake for the School of Public and International Affairs and Residential College. The current president, Christopher Eisgruber, I may have pronounced that wrong, in a statement when explaining why the board made its decision said, Wilson's racism was significant and consequential, even by the standards of his own time. He segregated the federal civil service after it had been racially integrated for decades, thereby taking America backward in its pursuit of justice. He not only acquiesced in, but added to the persistent practice of racism in this country, a practice that continues to do harm today. He went on further to say, and I am paraphrasing, Princeton is part of an America that has too often disregarded, ignored, or excused racism, allowing the persistence of systems that discriminate against black people. And yet another leading cause of misinformation regarding European and American history was due to the direct and indirect influence of the Daughters of the Confederacy. A great video to watch regarding the impact they had on American history was created by Vox, V-O-X, on YouTube, and it's titled, How Southern Socialites Rewrote Civil War History. Okay, so now let me show you more evidence as to why I believe that there were thousands of black Europeans that immigrated to America from Europe. Okay, so now let me show you more evidence as to why I believe that there were thousands of black Europeans that immigrated to America from Europe. All right, so I'm gonna start off with the great Daniel Webster. And so for many of you, you're wondering who the heck is Daniel Webster? Well, Daniel Webster was born in Salisbury, New Hampshire, January 18th, 1782. His parents were Ebenezer Webster and Abigail Webster. Ebenezer was a tavern owner, farmer, politician, and finally a judge. The Websters were of English and Scottish extraction. In Daniel's early life, he was educated at the Phillips Exeter Academy, and then he went on to Dartmouth College. Daniel was a lawyer and a statesman who represented New Hampshire and Massachusetts and the U.S. Congress. He also served as Secretary of State under Presidents Harrison, Tyler, and Fillmore. He argued over 200 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court and was a member of the Federalist Party and the National Republican Party and then the Whig Party. Okay, so my first piece of evidence is from the 53rd Congress, third session, Senate document, Proceedings in Congress upon the Acceptance of the Statues of John Stark and Daniel Webster, presented by the state of New Hampshire in 1895. As you can see on page 84, I quote, Captain Ebenezer Webster, father of the godlike Daniel, the great Constitution expounder, whose statue stands alongside that of Stark in Yonder Hall, and whose name is writ with his high on the scroll of fame. How little these men could have thought that this sublime portion awaiting them when Daniel, a young lawyer at Portsmouth, on his way to the courts in Concord, and Stark, living in the retirement of his farm, met at the old hotel in Hookset, and the hero of Bennington spoke from the sale of himself at one time for 40 pounds, and was ready to believe Daniel was the son of Captain Webster because of the same deep swarthy color of his face, only blacker. Again, pay attention. Not only is he saying Daniel's father was the same deep swarthy complexion, he says Daniel's face is even blacker. He doesn't mention his hair or eye color. He specifically mentions his face. Again, let me bring to your attention where this document comes from. It's from the 53rd Congress, third session Senate document, which is an excellent primary source. Okay, so let's look at my next piece of evidence, and this comes from the website Encyclopedia of World Biography. Under Notable Biographies, we have Daniel Webster. Okay, so you can see under the childhood section for Daniel Webster, first paragraph, it states, while a child, Daniel earned the nickname Black Dan from his dark skin and black hair and eyes. Again, as I have repeatedly said, 
Complexion means the color of skin on someone's face, which is why they had to further describe his hair and eye color, because complexion is a separate category of description. Okay, so my next piece of evidence was a book titled Life of Daniel Webster, given to Harvard Library in 1938, written by George Ticknor Curtis in 1870. As you can see on page 7, chapter title, Family Complexion, it goes on to read, This grandmother, his father's mother, was Susanna Bachelder, a descendant of the Reverend Stephen Bachelder in the county of Rockingham. She had black hair and black eyes, and was a woman of uncommon strength of character. Her son, Mr. Webster's father, inherited from her the Bachelder complexion. Her other sons had the Webster characteristics. The same division of parental traits took place in Mr. Webster's own generation. He himself has said that, of his four brothers, only one was dark like himself. The other three ran off into the general characteristics blind to the name. In fact, however, I have understood that his own brother, Ezekiel, who was represented as a model of manly beauty, although his complexion was not so dark as Daniel's, had black hair. Okay, so let's break this down just a little bit. So first the author acknowledges that Daniel's grandmother, his father's mother, had the back, back elder complexion, which he inherited from his father via his grandmother. The author further writes that even Daniel stated that of his four brothers, only one was dark like himself. The other three resembled the Webster family characteristics. And it goes on further to say that Daniel's brother, Ezekiel, had a dark complexion, but not as dark as Daniel's. And I'd like to bring this to your attention again. No one's describing Daniel, his father, or his brother as having a shallow or yellow, a light brown or brown complexions. They're consistently saying dark complexions, alluding to the fact that these back elders were very dark-skinned people. All right, so let's move on in the same book to page eight, and it's, we're going to be a little more than halfway down the page, and we'll pick up where it states, he has a complexion, as General Stark said of him, which burnt gunpowder will not change, and a heart, as his great son has said of him, which he seemed to have borrowed from a lion. Okay, so you see where General Stark stated that burnt gunpowder could not change his complexion? Burnt gunpowder is extremely black, so Stark's statement meant Daniel's complexion was so dark black that you couldn't tell the difference between his skin and burnt gunpowder. All right, so my next piece of evidence comes from a newspaper clipping from the Salem Gazette, dated February 18, 1834. And the clipping goes on to say, the Richmond Enquirer says, the course of Mr. Webster is anticipated with great interest. He is at this time one of the most prominent men on the chessboard. But we confess that we look to his movements with fear and suspicion. He is a man of gigantic powers, but they originally received a wrong direction. It is related by the white travelers in Africa that the ebony natives imagine the fair complexion of their visitors to be the effect of disease and consider white as hideous for the human skin. The judgment of the Richmond Enquirer as to the direction of Mr. Webster's powers resembles that of the Africans about complexion. So basically the Richmond Enquirer is stating that his complexion resembles that of an African. All right, so moving on to an additional piece of evidence, we can see page three of the book, Daniel Webster, The Order, copy written in 1903 by Albert E. Pillsbury, also located at the Harvard Library. The quote goes on to state, speaking about Daniel, he was a delicate child with a large head, coal black hair, great black eyes, which none who saw them ever forgot, and a complexion so swarthy that they called him Little Black Dan. All right, so again, Daniel's complexion is referred to as black which is where his nickname came from. It didn't come from his hair color or eye color, because that would make no sense. Okay, so let me ask you, 
How many of you know a white person with pale, fair, or fresh skin complexions that also have black hair and dark eyes and have a nickname with the adjective black in it? That would make any sense. Like Daniel, people with nicknames that have black in them probably 99% of the time means or meant that that person had dark skin or complexion. Okay, so my next piece of evidence comes from the book The True Daniel Webster, written by Sidney George Fisher, published in 1911. All right, so on page 21, you can see it states, on his father's side, he was descended from the back elders or the bad childers, a dark complexion, dark haired family from whom the poet Whittier was supposed to be descended. Okay, so moving down to the bottom of the page there, last paragraph, it says, his two descendants, Webster and Whittier, who are said to have resembled him and somewhat each other in striking appearance, would seem to indicate a prepotency to genius in the strain. Poetic and romantic sentiment filled the lives of both of them and was the foundation of Webster's oratory. Webster had the dark eyes, hair, and complexions of the Bach elders. Okay, we're moving on to page 22 now. Okay, and continue the quote, in excessive degree. Okay, so I keep giving you evidence of Daniel and his famous complexion. Now the author mentions Whittier, as in a famous poet, John Greenleaf Whittier, as being descended from the same dark complexion family. Uh-oh, spoiler alert. How far down the rabbit hole are we willing to uncover the truth? I say all the way. Okay, so we'll get to the poet John Whittier a little bit later in the video. All right, so still looking at Daniel Webster, on page 51 of the same book, it states, Ezekiel 2 joined the New England aristocracy of education. He was of dark hair and complexion like the father and Daniel, very handsome and famous all his life in New Hampshire for his good looks. His ability was of the solid conservative order, equal as some supposed to Daniel's, and he became a prominent citizen of New Hampshire an important man in politics, a member for many years of one or the other branch of the legislature, and a much sought legal advisor. But he had, it seems, none of the brilliance or quickness of apprehension of his distinguished brother, and died suddenly while speaking in the courtroom at Concord at the age of 49. So, according to this, uh, Dark Complexion Ezekiel was also of the New England aristocracy education. Funny thing, I grew up and was educated in New England and not a peep about the famous Webster family being black. Okay, so moving on to page 69 of the same book, I'm going to start off with a quote that states, His brothers and sisters had none of his marvelous power. He stood alone among them. In the animal kingdom, naturalists used to give to such sudden development in a species the name sport. And in modern times, the Darwinians call it a mutation. It is impossible to account for such appearances, as it is impossible to account for Mr. Webster's contemporary genius, Napoleon, the most extraordinary mutation in human intellect and physical endurance that has ever been known. Perhaps the cross of the blonde, slender Webster type of outdoor farming people with a dark complexion, heavy built, indoors, intellectual, learned, Bachelder strain was a lucky outcross, what the animal breeders call a nick. Such a combination of opposites will sometimes give us a hunting dog or a horse, unmatched for courage, breath, and speed, as Sir Walter Scott would say. But even in this profound explanation is merely another way of saying, I don't know. So basically, as I interpret this, I believe the author... I'm going to pause that right there. Um, we can see that as mankind, womenkind. A neck, right? Light tan to all the way to extremely dark tan. It's just a neck, right? And uh, because our genes split off and make their own little patterns uh, for each and every every single uh, person out there. Uh, you can't just have eight billion people and everybody looks the same. So the neck has to be in there to kind of change up the genes a little bit. And we get these different shades. I was baffled by how the dark complexion Daniel 
could have stood out virtually alone amongst all of his family with his genius and skill, not to be duplicated by any of them, even though many of them had the white Webster family complexions. I definitely feel a hint of racism coming from the author. Remember, he was writing this book in the early 1900s, more than 50 years after Daniel's death, and white supremacy was really ramping up, making the way for the Woodrow Wilson era. So, before I end this video, I want to show you images of Daniel Webster that I found online. Now, as you can see, these are three typical images of Daniel that you find when conducting research online. Does anything immediately jump out of you? Yeah, well, the most glaring thing is that Daniel is not shown as being dark complexion, let alone swarthy or black. Remember, his childhood nickname was Little Black Dan. And according to his descriptions, he's supposed to have really dark skin. This is obviously not the case based on the images that I was able to find of him. As I mentioned before, whoever owns the media, that's like newspapers, libraries, historical societies, photos, paintings, etc., or can provide access to them, controls what the public sees. Therefore, we get images that don't match the description of these people that I'm showing you. Please keep that in mind while you're watching my videos. Look, I just have to truly confess that I'm fascinated by this research. I hope this video has been interesting so far, or at least informative. Okay. Uh, so is it possible Daniel Webster was uh, what y'all called black man? Y'all decide. This will be people news. Bye, y'all.